Okay, well, welcome back. Today we get to talk a little bit. I want to do something a little different than I did last week. Last week I started with a whole bunch of questions that came out of some suggestions, but let me do it a little different and free up some time for you to say things that uh, caught your attention or, uh, again, always maybe you didn't like, or, hey, I was reading this and it just got me thinking about this thing that we do or this thing we, we could do. And so let me just open the floor to, to what the book's doing for you so far. Well, something that popped up to my head just, just a minute ago, as I was looking at the questions, you know, and maybe this is, this is my, own, my own problem, not anyone else's. I don't know who the vestry is. I don't know how many people are in the vestry. I don't know how they get there. I'm not sure. Uh, I know it's a kind of like a pastoral council because I was very at, at, at St. Bernadette's. I was at the pastoral council, and we were kind of the, the non-official leaders. We worked very closely with the priests. So, what's the vestry, and I'm, who are they? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that because um, somebody asked me about that the other day, uh, and they said, "Hey, our vestry is not on the website," and I was really happy to say, in fact, that they are. <laughs> Um, so I will put the, the link directly to that, uh, but here's, here's, vestry is an interesting word, Graziella, and um, it really comes from the word vest. The vestry are the folk that vest the rector, like dress them up oh, and yeah. sort of stand behind and support the rector. So really what vestry kind of means, honestly, is like board of directors. And their chief uh, function is to be the fiduciary responsibilities of the parish and uh, to kind of protect the grounds. Now here at St. Thomas, uh, the vestry actually are folks that take ownership uh, and oversight and vision casting for the parish. So we have 13 people on the vestry right now. Um, the way it's organized is that the rector picks what's called the senior warden uh, so the rector picks that person. If I get run over by a car, the senior warden's going to run the church. Not do communion, but they'll be the fiduciary responsibility. The junior warden is elected by the vestry, and in many churches, they become the facility chair. Uh, here we have a separate facility chair, but curiously enough, our junior warden is both uh, the facility chair and the junior warden. That's Herb Meyer. Uh, vestry is elected to three-year terms. You Ideally, husband and wife or mother and daughter or father and son, they don't serve concurrently on the vestry. We like to kind of have a little bit of separation. Um, as I mentioned, it's a three-year term. And what our vestry meetings look like here at St. Thomas are let's review our financials. And also uh, let's our vestry each take an area of ministry that they keep the rest of the vestry informed on. So for example, somebody, uh, updates us all ahead of a vestry meeting on scouts through a report. Somebody updates us on music ministry or on newcomer ministry. So we come to the meeting, prepare with these reports. Uh, we talk about opportunities at hand, uh, whether with the diocese or in the community, and we collaboratively make decisions. So, you know, uh, the vestry has been on top of the COVID protocols all throughout. And it's been really nice because we have like a, a robust group. Um, some people are more conservative, some people more liberal, so it comes out, you know, in the wash. And that's the best route. Uh, that may not have been real satisfying. Maybe other people want to add something. I was just thinking, so it goes to, from the vest, the vestry kind of is your, or your board or your directress. Yes. So, so to speak. Um, but then, then I think, well, from there to the common ordinary person who just walks in the, in the aisle, walks in, how do those people know, or where is there information about who the vestry is? Hmm. You know, is there a chairperson? Uh, something, something, and, and, I, and, and I, don't, I don't mean for you to have to publish a whole book or something. Hmm. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> There's, there's lots of books on this. I'm not sure exactly what I'm asking for, Mike, but somehow where that information goes down to the to the everyday folks that are sitting in the pew. Yeah. Well, we every year at the annual meeting, we elect the vestry, and it's a great opportunity to see folks. 
uh, as I mentioned, we do have all the Vestry people's names on our website, and I've put that link there in the chat. Um, and when we're wearing our name tags and when we're all coming to church like normal, the Vestry, their name tag also has the word Vestry on there. And um, the Vestry is not like uh, some kind of like uh, middle management that receives your complaints and brings them to the clergy. Uh, really, they're just your representatives. And so if you ever go to a vestry member and say like, boy, I hate the priest, I'll be really disappointed if they don't say, you need to tell that to the priest. And if you don't feel comfortable going on your own, I'll go with you just so you have somebody, you know, and you're not alone. But uh, it's not the complaint department. We're, we're really in this together is the goal. Um, and, and hopefully when we come back, and a little more normalized, you'll start seeing those vestry name tags, if that makes sense. Yes. yes. Now, a lot of people get confused because here's the real bottom line in our polity. The bishop owns the building and we serve at the bishop's pleasure. And um, I come in as a rector and I'm, I'm, a, um, I'm a tenured person. So it turns out I'm really difficult to get rid of. And uh, hopefully we like each other. And the vestry actually doesn't have any power to get rid of me at all. So we're really here to, they're really here to vest to the rector, that is to make this work. Now, sometimes there's been really ugly times here at St. Thomas, there was a really ugly time where the vestry like didn't like each other and they didn't like the priest and they wouldn't even take communion yeah. together. And that happens rarely. And we learn from that, I think. Like we learn, lesson learned, we're not gonna be those people again. I, I really think that. So I, we learned that lesson. Yeah. Ellen, you, you, you got okay. something. Oh, I, I just wanted to say that I think if somebody really wants to, the vestry meetings are open and people can, can attend. Is that correct? Yeah, they're always open. Now, if we're ever talking about like employment, we would call right. an executive session to protect our employees, but we don't do that very often. That's just when we discuss things like raises and things like that. Um, the vestry meetings are in person again. Uh, so we're coming back to our first in-person vestry meeting since COVID this Tuesday. Where, where exactly does that happen? Or It'll happen in Christ Hall this week, and it always starts with communion. And, oh, okay. Yeah, it starts with communion. And people, uh, anybody in the church, and I don't actually care if you're a member or not, you always have voice at a vestry meeting, even though you don't have a vote, right? Only the vestry votes. It is really curious to know that uh, we are a Republican form of government. So we're not a true democracy, which means the vestry are not called to represent their constituents in the parish. They're called to vote their own conscience. Yeah. And that's, that's Republican government. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're curious, you're again, uh, this Tuesday night at 630, we'll have our next vestry meeting. They're pretty fun, actually, uh, because because the vestry is involved in all the ministries of the church one way or another. So it's, it's sort of nice. Sometimes I hear my peers that are like, Oh, another vestry meeting, but I've had like two vestry meetings that weren't particularly fun, but they were necessary. And, and we did our work together. Yeah. And that's in six years. So in general, they're like really, really nice. <laughs> Anybody else want to share reactions you've had to the book, positive or negative, or like, oh, hey, this was a great idea? Oh, I, I marked several things. I thought it was fun that different churches talked about steps they had taken, mm -hmm. and I thought there were some really easy ones that St. Thomas could do like the signs for the parking, they had a big sort of um, A-frame sign that they said, you are welcome, come here for worship, and then turn here for parking. And I know our parking lot is probably on the bottom of the list and it needs work, but the little visitor parking signs are all faded and it would be easy enough to just replace those with welcome visitors or something like that, a newer, brighter one that's more obvious. And we do host art shows and the, the food distributions and other things. And I, it's very easy to say, we're so happy you're here. Mike, you always do that. But to say, and we would love to see you at church on Sunday. You know, we have services at, at 8 and 1030. Come as you are. And if you don't know anything about it, somebody will help you. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, I'm actually also really happy to say that we just 
uh, we're getting ready to redo the restrooms in the Crist Hall. And um, we kind of got our knickers in a twist about whether we should try to make them like fully ADA compliant because uh, we'd lose a stall if we did that. Um, but I'm really happy to say we have an ADA compliant restroom in the building and you only have to have one. So we just need signs that point out where that is. <laughs> so we ordered those signs because that's important, right? That people know if you're in a wheelchair, this one fits the requirements. So signage is, is kind of important. We're lucky as a church that it's, I don't know that it's completely obvious, but there's pretty much just only one door you can come into instead of like nine different entrances. That, that I think helps us a little bit. And I think we are fortunate because Brimley Hall is a lovely place. I mean, you come in the main yeah. doors. That's the real obvious way to come in. You come in the main doors and then you're in the narthex. And especially since we've redone all the flooring, it looks fabulous. It's a very inviting, welcoming place. So it, yeah. it is easy to invite people in. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I feel like, and I could be wrong, but I feel like we do preach practice and model welcoming strangers here. Uh, I think particularly because we do things like come join the food distribution, whether you come to church or not, which I think is really nice. And people do that every time. If you've been to these, there's like three or four people that come every time that I don't know where they go for church, um, but they feel very welcome to serve here, I think. So I think that's nice. Um, I have to tell you, this reminded me of a story. I, I, uh, I had two conversations with people this week at the pool. So my daughter's on the swim team and you have to go to the pool and stay there the whole time, which is kind of obnoxious, but you do. Right. And so there's nothing to do. And I do things there like read this book. And I, <laughs> I, I, had, I had two conversations in the last week. So one was with this lady who runs, did I tell you the story last week? Um, she runs and, and uh, she said, oh, I've seen you running. And I, and I asked her, you know, like, are you training for a race? And she's like, oh, I'm going to do a long race again this year. And I was like, well, where? She was like, Boston, <laughs> which is kind of, by the way, that's kind of significant, right? So, so she's this like super runner. And uh, we talked a lot about running. And I mentioned that I have a flexible schedule. And sometimes I'll, you know, if I have a night meeting, I'll run during the day. And she said, oh, where do you work? And I said, oh, over here at St. Thomas. And the next time I saw her, she said, oh, are you the teacher over there? And I said, well, no, I'm, I'm the priest. And she was like, oh, like we're looking for a church. And I, I found myself immediately sort of go like, oh, what do I say? Uh, so, I, you know, she was like, are you the one who gives like the sermon sometimes? And I was like, well, sort of every time. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, sometimes it can be really long, but it's a really pretty building and people are really nice. And, and it may, you know, I found myself in this weird position where I was like, man, I don't want to lose a running contact uh, by just like corralling people into church. So I found myself being really weird. Fortunately, there was a parishioner there who's a grandma who was like, oh, it's a nice place and whatever. There was another person at the pool. I, I hid this earring in, not because it's Pride Month, actually just because I really like the color. And she said to me, well, how does your congregation handle that? And I said, oh, that's the least of their worries at this point. <laughs> and uh, and her, her family is really hurt. She's got a fifth, year, fifth grade daughter and her family's really sensitive to social justice and Pride Month. Now that none of them actually are, are in the, the gay category, they're all cisgender, but the fifth grade kid is, is like really important. And, and so she said like, well, what do you, you know, like how, what does your church feel about that? And I said, well, we're the only one in the neighborhood that's open and affirming, you know, and if people aren't, they understand that in general, the place is. And I think that's right. And I read this book and I thought, you know, I should probably say something else to her. So this week I said, you know, uh, you, because the questions you asked, I just want, you know, your daughter is eligible to be like an altar girl, like an acolyte. And, um, you know, I don't know if that appeals to you, but we're, we're training those kids. And um, if it does, you know, be happy to talk. And she was like, 
Well, I would actually, I think she would really be interested in that. Um, but I don't know about the church and what you believe, like who can have communion? Oh, I was like, well, everybody can. <laughs> She's like, well, we just need to sit down with you. And it, I feel like I did my good deed for the week, you know, by like going back to that lady. I probably need to go back to the runner lady and be like, you know, I don't mean to come across weird. Because I do think we're a good good group of folks, and I'd love to see you in church. You know, like that's probably what I need to do. I have to admit, it's it's easy for me to be like the invite person, we, because like I'm a human being and have like interests. And sometimes, like when you share an interest with somebody who's in your church, it starts to get kind of strange. <laughs> I find myself not always wanting to tell people what I do when I'm not wearing this because there's a switch that flicks in their brain when they hear that. I don't know if that makes sense. It's so I'm sensitive. It's not just y'all. It's also me. And uh, look, I can't help it when I wear this, although some people don't know what this is, which I think is really funny. Uh, they've never clearly seen movies like The Exorcist or anything like that. Um, but um, it, I get it. Sometimes it's a little bit, when I think about it, I'm not scared of it or anything like that. I just sometimes, I like to keep relationships in certain lanes. And I think that's probably true of all of us. And I think this book is actually trying to encourage us. And I've heard a couple of people talk about this. We don't necessarily have to tell people like, I go here and you should too. Uh, I heard a really great speaker say, sometimes it's just nice to identify. And I go to St. Thomas and I really like it. And then, and then that's all you need to say because people will remember that or not, and then they'll choose to ask you. But one of the steps we probably need to make as Episcopalians is just to say, oh, and by the way, <laughs> like my church means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. and, and then that's maybe all the invitation we sometimes need to give because people then know that about us and otherwise they may not know. So I think it's an easy warm up is to identify as a person of faith. Ellen, please. Who was, I can't remember his name, but we went down to uh, St. Mark's in Bel Air, I think, and heard somebody speak about um, inviting. That was like he said, six years ago, wasn't it? It's been several years. But yeah. what he said that makes it a little easier in some ways is it's up to us to issue the invitation when we're um, hopefully comfortable in whatever way we feel comfortable doing it. But after that, it, it's not our responsibility about whether they accept the invitation or not. And so we just need to say, hi, come on by, or we're having this, come check it out, or um, be present in things and, and share it with people we think might like it. I have people who haven't come yet, but they're very interested in knowing we do a food drive. So there are things that are both inviting and connecting um, that we do. And maybe we just need to appreciate those and use them a little more. I think that's really fair. I, I really appreciate that feedback. And I, there is this tension, I think, when we think about these, because I grew up in churches that were very like targeted and they had programs. And to be honest, they were a little bit pushy. And some people like being pushed, but I did, I mean, personally, because I came from that, I like this line where she said, you know, we give a quiet welcome for healing and we make space for people without smothering them. And, and I needed a church to do that for me. Um, which I think is really, you know, finding the, the right balance point between those is, I think, is really the invitation for us. And, and part of it is to just err on the side of easy invitation and then allow the follow up from other folk instead of us saying like, hey, you come to church this week? You come to church this week? You come to church this week, right? We want people to say yes, not to make us shut up, but because like they're interested. I think it would be interesting to find out how there are some people that I see that were uh, new to the church in the past five years, how they came to come to the ch our church. St. Thomas. And we asked that at every newcomer's lunch, how'd you hear about the church? Um, and, and people have interesting responses to that, you know? And uh, I think it's one of those things, sometimes we also think like, oh, I don't know if that person's been going here before, so I don't know if I should ask their name because I ought to know it. 
or like maybe they've been going here longer than I have and I just don't know. And it's this great thing to say like, life's too short to worry about those things. I'm not sure if I've met you or I probably have and I just don't remember your name. Would you tell me again? And how'd you find this place? Like, I'm just curious, you know, like without grilling somebody, those are reasonable questions to ask, right? Like they're reasonable. How'd you find that new restaurant? Oh, I saw it in the paper. What made you decide to try it? And, and like, what do you like about it? Like, we talk about stuff like that all the time. Darlene, I see you're, I, th I see you're ready. Yes. Uh, I want to credit Kathy Hill for uh, telling me about St. Thomas. And I, I'm sure you've heard this before, but Kathy and I were yoga buddies and we would put our mats together. And before and after class, we'd talk about things that, that were important to us. And I think she recognized that social justice was a, a strong passion of mine. And also she, I was pretty open about not, not having a church that I felt comfortable in. And Kathy said, hmm, I think you would be a good fit for St. Thomas. And uh, so I'm grateful for that invitation from Kathy. And I hope this is a great example, Darlene, because like you stand out as one of those people who have come and like really been inspirational with your gifts uh, to I think probably everybody on the screen. And, and I think this is what the book is trying to say is not only when we can invite people, but like when you connect naturally, that's, and I, I perceive you connect the way you wanna connect. And it's really, it's really meaningful for all of us. I, I think so. Well, it's been very meaningful for me. I've found a home. These win-wins is what we're all about. And I have to tell you, I think um, uh, alongside the book, and I think, I wish we could figure out a way, not like a system, but a way to do this, you know, and I know I've said this before, but I really think the future of the church looks like what follows. Instead of saying like, oh, you'd be great for the altar guild, we have this opportunity to like get to know somebody. And if they happen to do something to say like, how can we use that for the community that God has in mind? And, you know, like I've got folks here and you may or may not know them. They're, they're, um, their partner isn't interested in church at all, but they love doing parish work days. Boy, it'd be silly not to use their joy because that's, I mean, that's ministry, right? And I, I increasingly I'm getting like, hey, maybe services aren't for you, but serving food is for you. And that's a part of the church. So instead of having this weird thing where like, well, I'm a full member and you're a half member, members are people who share themselves in ministry, even if that means hosting a shrimp boil, or making chocolatinis for a reception. I found those people. I found the chocolatini people, and I love those people, <laughs> you know? And next month, somebody's, I mean, I don't know what they think about God, but they're going to come talk about astrophysics, and um, that's what they do. And what they think about God, I don't know if it's quite as important as their willingness to share their gifts with the rest of us. That might have just sounded really heretical, but I think that's the ministerial vision she flirts with. If we're going to make this not a program, and she says this isn't a program, this is a vision, uh, then I think vision, like where the church is going to go, if it's going to live, is that not only do we meet people where we are, we appreciate where they are, and we connect the things they already want to do with ministry and mission. I met this guy yesterday, so and he and he, I don't know who told him he's Catholic, he's gonna be Catholic, but he's really interested in solar energy, and he was like, "I heard you guys might be interested in solar panels," and I was like, "Of course we'd be interested in solar panels, but no one knows anything about it." He was like, "Oh, I do. I would love to tell you about solar panels," and I was like, "You know, you don't need to convert, but I'll take that membership." <laughs> I mean, really, you know, like, why would we want to be any other way than that? I don't mean to be preachy, but I wonder when she talks in chapter four, three, she asks us, she talks about Jesus seeing people. And I want to follow up that question because this kind of thinking in my head is like answers the question, when have you felt seen in church? And I'd love to ask that question. 
when have you felt seen? I don't mean evaluated. I mean, when have you felt looked at, noticed, appreciated for who you are in church? Doesn't have to be at St. Thomas, by the way. No, I'm not, I'm not limited in that. The, um, the one thing that, that uh, uh, when we would go over to St. Clair's sometimes, the priest there, Father Vincent, would come out before the Mass began, and he would ask if, if people were visitors to the church, and you have them stand, stand up and tell where, you know where they're from and that kind of stuff. And that felt very, like, you know, you, you, you were being recognized. Mm -hmm. We have these wonderful greeters here, either formally or informally, who when people are new, they'll say, hey, Mike, there's this new people. <laughs> Make sure you, or they're, they're from Spokane, but they've just moved into the neighborhood. And that's so nice because it makes sure that I remember not to be insular in my thinking. It's really, really lovely. Ellen, please. Oh, yeah. I think some of this is making well one making church or church activities relevant and then that expands the community it might be a running subset of the community or a cooking subset or whatever um but also i think maybe we all can be more aware or even trained a little bit coached in how to welcome people what to ask that's not too personal how to read even body language a little bit but um how to be friendly. Yeah, thanks. Kathy? Yep. One of the things Lauren and I used to do, um, we haven't done lately, is invite uh, someone to lunch with us after church. Yeah. And um, that, that worked really well. Um, we haven't, haven't done it lately, so this book reminds me that's something I might need to start doing again. A couple or a person that I hadn't met before I absolutely hate it. If I've met them and I say, gee, I haven't met you. And they said, yeah, we met you two weeks ago, but that happens. Anyhow, <laughs> I like, I like to do that. And so other people that like to entertain or go out to lunch, that's just a suggestion. I, I think it's a great idea. We tried this thing a few years ago, Kathy, and it didn't work, seem to work very well, but I'd be very happy to try it again too, is to get a chalkboard out and say, Join us for lunch today. And then you can put your name and where you're going. Um, yeah. We don't really have people sign up very often, but I, I think maybe that's one of those really easy things like, oh, I'd like to, you know, I'd be happy to go out to lunch with some people. And, and then there's this question, and I think it's always a challenge for us, especially in the pandemic, because we're not so used to seeing each other. The question is, are we a community of friends or are we a friendly community? Oh, good. And that's always, I think it's always a difficult balance, particularly because many of us once a week, right? Or twice a month might be as often as we see each other. And there is that really strong desire to be um, a community of friends. There is. And we have to lay some of that down to be a friendly community. I think like you're saying to say like, hey, I'm very welcome for, and, and we don't have to do it every week. But I'm, I'm, I'm very willing for you to join us at lunch and I'll dedicate the time I wanted to spend catching up with my friend. I will give you the time listening to you. And it, and it once a month, once every six months, whatever it is, if we're willing to do that, I think that's probably part of the traction that she's asking us to, to hold. Mm -hmm. Ellen? And we're working on an, um, reviving the newcomer lunches. So sometime in the middle of the summer, probably maybe toward the end, we'll be having another newcomer lunch. And um, those of you who have been to them before but haven't ever been, please come. It's not just for newcomers. It's nice to have parishioners there too to converse and sit at the table with them. So um, look for that, please. Thank you. I think August 15th is going to work with Cindy Ellen. So okay. uh, that's like the Sunday before school starts. So okay. we think everybody will be here. And it is a great opportunity, I think, to bring your family, even if you've been coming for years, and just, you know, have a pretty low threshold meal with somebody else.
Let me ask you this question, because she talked about this a little bit in chapter three as well. Were there times in your life when the welcome you needed from church looked different? Kathy? I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, she, she, she talks about, like, sometimes we think, ah, welcome. Here's how we welcome people. We do step A and then B and then C, and that's what we do. And, and the question is really, I think, to think a little bit more like holistically and through our own experience, are there times when that would have met what we needed or were there times when we needed something different from A, B, C? Okay, um, I can answer that because when we lived in Houston, we were, sh we were shopping, church shopping, mm -hmm. um, Episcopal church shopping, and it really did make a difference how we were greeted. And I think, but I, I think there are differences in people, what kind of greetings different people like. And so, yes, you know, that's. That's what she's asked. That's kind of what I'm asking. What greeting, do you, what greetings do, do you I like? like or need and have those changed for you at different times in your life? And maybe I should say, say first, uh, when I first started in the Episcopal church, um, I was going on Sunday morning before I worked in the Methodist church. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, what they did not need is somebody trying to incorporate me into the life of their church because I had a job in a different one. What I needed was a place where I could go and experience the liturgy. And maybe people said hello. Actually, that was relatively irrelevant for me. I needed a, a place where I could go and be welcomed enough to just go. And later in my life, um, I needed another similarly strange welcome because uh, I had been working in a United Church of Christ church, and it was like kind of a toxic environment. And so I needed to leave. And I started going to this little kind of country Episcopal church in the middle of uh, El Cajon, which is like coast uh, inlands from San Diego. And I, and I just needed people to like, let me come to the church and not like try to hug me during the piece or sign me up for the vestry uh, because I was like <laughs> under, you know, 40. So it was, it, what I needed was room to just engage with the liturgy. There's been times where I've really needed that. And if people had come and tried to sign me up for the stuff, it would have been real bad. I, I can tell you that one of the welcome needs of my family that usually doesn't go well, right? And it's happened more than once my partner comes to church and people say, you'd be great in the youth ministry. And her response is, I'm not coming back. Because that's a pretty intimate ask for somebody the first time they come, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Well, Mike, maybe that's back to what she, um, Mary Palmer talks about listening. Yes listen to people and say and say well what are you looking for in a church what interests you what needs do you have because we have many things on offer and um, we don't want to ignore you but we don't want to overwhelm you yeah and that goes back to one of the things she mentions in in addition to really seeing people she emphasizes listening to people absolutely and that's a way of welcoming the stranger, right? Right. When we, when we greet, there are people that just really want to walk by. Mm -hmm. And it's really obvious. And, and it's easy to step back. I mean, I don't want to chase somebody into the church to get their name on a list. So I think sensitivity at the greeter's desk Ellen, <laughs> you and I, <laughs> that um, really there are people that just want to come in and go straight to the sanctuary. And there are other people that want to ask questions and hang out yeah. and um, be introduced to somebody. And one of the things I don't do very well, but I think Ellen does very well and Lauren does very well, is after the service, try to get people together as they're coming out of the church, because if you're waiting in line to see Mike, you have, as you, you're the preacher or the minister, as you're walking out, they, you have time to talk to people. And um, anyway, 
Those are my comments. Thank you. I, I think, and I think, Kathy, what you said and what our greeters do really well is this just little phrase like, hey, I've noticed you. <laughs> like, I've seen that you're here. And forgive me, I just don't know if I've seen you at this service before. And um, and I'd like, I'd like to welcome you and just hear a little more about you. Uh, I, I think without turning that into an interview, there's a way to make that the invitation. And part of it is like, I noticed, you don't have to be the phrase, but I, I noticed you today. <laughs> and maybe you've been here before, but I noticed you today. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Darlene, I'm Julia. And um, these are my little boys. And, you know, here's over there's my husband. And um, I'd love to leave, just hear a little bit more about you. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's hard. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of room for rejection there. Sometimes people do that. Like I've, I've greeted people before and said like, hey, welcome, I'm Mike, you know, and I'm not sure I've met you. I've been coming here for 10 years. I've heard people say that. I'm like, okay, and I'm, and I'm Mike, and I don't think we've met. <laughs> so just have to like, take a deep breath, you know, um, and ultimately there's not a whole lot at stake in that, in that, you know? I don't think we've met. That I can say that with a lot of truth. <laughs> Graciela and Tim are relatively new, and I want to know how you felt when you were first walked into the door, or what made you walk into the door the first time? Oh, that's a good question. What made us walk into the door the first time was actually kind of a different. We go to the university for continuing ed classes, and Samuel Gladden, yeah. Samuel Gladden made an announcement about um, the, 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 icon the icon painting class that was happening. And uh, Tim was really interested in icons. And we both, we actually both were, but as it turned out, I got ill. I remember I had a sinus infection or something, so I could not come, but Tim came and he worked on an icon and he was very uh, impressed and felt so good about being welcome without being overwhelmed or, or being you know, chased down to, to become a member or anything like that. It was just a very welcoming experience and it was a quiet experience. And if I'm not mistaken, he sat near Mike when he was working on this, on this icon, but they never even really talked. Um, so that's how then he said, well, honey, let's, let's, let's go there and give it a try. And the first, I guess for me, the first service I went to was so much like being in a Catholic church. The, the mass itself is very much like the Catholic service. And I was very impressed with that and liked it very much. I liked the smaller community. And so that's how we got started. And the other thing that we both like is that it is an open parish. Yes, yes, yes. We like that a lot. Ellen, please. I, I don't know, it works for me because I'm bad at names and I know I've seen that person somewhere before. And so I just go up and say, I've probably met you 50 times before, but I'm terrible with names. Mm -hmm. And I'll probably ask you 50 more times, but, and they always laugh or whatever and tell me their name and nobody seems to have been offended. And I've, I don't know, that works for me. Helen, I think the message, it, the, the important message that you're giving them is that you want to know them. You yeah. want to know their name. It, they're not going to be so impressed with the fact that you know their name or not. It's that you care enough to want to, to see them and to really hear them and, and put their name to it. So go for it. Uh, Graciela, you mentioned an open parish and I, I guess I'm not sure what you meant by that. And well, accepting of all peoples, regardless of their background, their orientation, or anything else. Okay. I, 
I think what for me it means specifically oh we happened to be in an incident the first one of the few times the first early times we came where Mike was asking people who was, had anniversaries to come forward and shake hands and and meet each other and and he introduced him to the congregation he would he would do I know he still does that and there was a young girl there was a little girl sitting over to the, from us, to the far left. And she said, my moms, my moms, my moms are here. And she was with two women who obviously were, and, and, and Mike said, come on over. And it was, I thought, wow, number one, the little girl just spontaneously was so proud of her moms. And Mike responded with simply inviting them up and introducing them to the congregation and, and they, it, it was, it was so, and, and that was like one of our first or second times at the church. And we were very impressed. I, I, was, I was concerned that you might mean um, neighborhood boundaries for attending a church. I don't know how to say that. Mike, help me out. Oh, well, sometimes we think of a parish in a geographic sense. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, think, um, I think part of the ministerial vision that she refers to is uh, for us to grow so that we don't welcome people regardless of their background, but with regard to their background. <laughs> Instead of you're welcome here anyway, it's you're especially welcome here. <laughs> I'm trying to make that turn in my own life because it just seems real important, you know? Well, I always love the Iona prayer that we say at the beginning, come all you who yeah. have been before and who haven't. Every This is the Lord's table and he invites you here. This, and like Graciela, I was raised Catholic and I do love the liturgy. And I just love how inclusive our parish in particular is because the Catholics are back to what you were asking about, Carolyn, their parish boundaries. You live in this area, you go to this parish. And you, at least when I was growing up, you, you had no choice. You went to the, the Catholic church where you were in, in that particular area. Yeah. And the fact that you couldn't go to communion if you weren't a baptized Catholic, baptized and confirmed Catholic, all this other kind of stuff. And, and here we just say, we want you just the way you are. Let me ask you a question that's, oh, Julia, please. Well, I can go after you if you want to, but. No, 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 please. Um, I was just thinking that I think for me, I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty shy. <laughs> and so, um, you know, and I, I don't know that, uh, I think I'm becoming more comfortable in my skin, especially in a, a church setting, right? Um, but I think what was really helpful for me, and I know I'm, I'm an old millennial, but I'm a millennial. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I, this pandemic and the opportunity for YouTube um, and being able to participate that way. And even through the like small Wednesday group um, and like watching stuff after the fact um, was really, helpful for me um because it was a safe a safe way to interact uh and then um get to know people that's so weird virtually but get to know people and you know everybody's name pops up you know when you're on the screen and so you can be like oh I know you and then I see you in person and, and you can I don't know that's helpful for me um I don't know how that I mean, I don't know if that just continues as is, right? But I, I was on the, the email list, so that's how I knew about it, right? Um, but I don't know how, I don't know, that's something that's been helpful and sort of a safe, I don't know where Sam is. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> we lost one of them. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's, that's what I um, would have to say. I think well, if I, we could- I, hope, I certainly hope you felt connected just speaking to you as a directly to you, because um, I mean, you've you've chosen to be very thoughtful um, and open with your questions and comments and with people, whether you're on the screen or not. 
And, um, and maybe that's part of the connect part that she's talking about. I mean, maybe we're talking about things that are natural connects for you and you've, you've chosen to open yourself and your thoughts. And I mean, I can tell you, it's been a really powerful ministry to me uh, because of how thoughtful you are. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I, I, uh, I don't know. I think I'm also at a time in my life where I'm looking for that connection. Right. And so, you know, things, things align sometimes, but um, I think you, to your question earlier about like a time when um, like what is helpful at different times during your life or whatever. And I think the opportunity for like meaningful connection after a year and a half of, even though it's like connection virtually via email, um, at times it's, it's been really helpful. I'd like to say that on Wednesdays, I look forward to the questions that you've submitted to Mike, because it gives me an opportunity to know more about how your mind thinks and what you're interested in and what's piquing your interest. Whereas at church or the food distribution, we've just had little bits of time yeah. to say hi, for me to laugh at your son jumping in the water puddle after church, uh, or for you to share the palette that you and your sons were sitting on when I needed to sit down that Saturday. So, I mean, we've had bits of interaction, but the, the questions on Wednesday, even though you weren't there, it made me feel more connected to you. So I'm grateful for those questions. Keep them coming. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate that. I feel virtually connected. <laughs> it's sort of it's weird, but it, it's helpful. Um, and it's like a very feels very life-giving and I think um I don't know just thinking also I guess too COVID still is getting more it's getting things are changing right and allowing for those opportunities um more in person you know seems um exciting but also I can't participate in person on a Wednesday morning like I would never be able to do that so having that still remain as a virtual option is really would be really helpful for me at least. It's it's there it's there to stay. Yeah. Yeah. Um let me ask another question that uh, she raises in chapter 4 and um this is really a general question and I, I it's not wrapped up in personality at all. So please just answer the question as you will. Um she says this line that clergy aren't really there to give away power but to empower laity for ministry. And I'm just curious to know, not just here, but at other parishes, what are ways that the church has empowered you? Uh, she's talked a little bit about spiritual gift discernment, and we recently did an Enneagram study here. Um, some people find it through ministry initiatives, but in what ways, affirmatively, have churches in your past empowered you? Mike, you know, you told me a couple of times when we were talking, you just said, oh, that's your ministry. And I thought, oh, right. Like, I had just never thought of it that way. And that was very liberating and empowering for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was very simple, but it changed my perspective. Well, I think that can be a paradigm shift if you think about it as a ministry, instead of I'm just helping around church or I'm doing this, that, or the other to say, well, maybe this is your gift and this is, we should, you should be doing more of this or how can we help you do more of this? Thank you. Thank you. I think that's right. I think that's where the book invites us to try to use not jettison church talk, but to apply them more precisely. <laughs> Having things for children to do in the service is evangelism, and it's a spiritual gift. It's not busy work. It's not like tertiary to what we do. It's primary to what we do. And Kathy Delgado does that ministry. <laughs> I 
Oh, Graciela, you're on mute. There you go. Oh, sorry. You're good now. No, you're, you're good. Oh, I, I appreciate having the opportunity to read. Um, and and I, I really am gracious, gracious or feel great gratitude, Mike, that you've been very inviting and telling me that you appreciate how I read. Oh, yeah. And um, it's, it's, I, you know, it just makes me feel very much like a part of what, of the service. And it's very special to me. Thank you. And, and you're not in this category, but I realized uh, like two churches ago, we had a reader who had a mild form of autism. And, uh -huh. and, and this lady would get up and read. And she would read very flat tonally. And one day somebody came up and said like, well, why don't people read with any real feeling around here? And they said, oh, sweetie, you just don't understand <laughs> that person's ministry to us and how that's mutual ministry. So let me fill you in. <laughs> and being able to do that is I think really empowering for ministry. And sometimes we just notice like, oh, that person doesn't do it the way I'm used to. And we rarely ask like, why might that be? Or what might that mean for them? Right. And um, that seems like one of those invitation pieces, like, hey, I've noticed, I've noticed you're a lector and I've always thought about that job. And like, what does that mean for you? I don't think that's a bad interview. You know, like, I don't, I don't think that's a really a bad way to, to chase a line of thought. Like, why do you do that thing that you do? I'm hoping you guys uh, and, and gals feel empowered uh, to think and have questions and, and, and sort of raise doubts, especially at St. Thomas. Uh, it does occur to me that there is uh, more of this empowerment ministry that I've missed down on a little bit, which is like, um, you know, I was really glad to do the Enneagram work. It was really helpful for me, not as a, hey, look, now we're done. Now we know how to be ourselves. But that kind of like self-actualization to be done in a community has been really, really empowering uh, for me as well to dive into like, not my spiritual gifts per se, but again, like the gifts of like being me and to hear the gifts of you being you and to do that together has been really helpful. Uh, it is like one of my hopes for us as we go forward into family ministry is that we like, somehow figure out how it is that we appropriately mentor our, uh, our young women and young men to, uh, to grow into who God's made them to be instead of like, here's a program for being a good person. Um, we see the goodness in you, so let's help you grow into that. You know, And finding the right mentorship seems really, really important to me. Um, I don't know that it happens a lot for us as adults, and it, it seems it seems like that's some of the work of the church that needs to be developed um, even more so. You guys have been really patient with me, but you know, um, Roberta Nett's written a couple of books and I've referred to her as well about how in general uh, churches are attended by like 80% women. And then what you hear is this like masculine view of spirituality that doesn't apply. And so like that kind of empowerment to have that conversation, uh, it seems real important to me, uh, even though I'm kind of late doing it. <laughs> well, let me ask a, a final question uh, to respect our time. Again, I, I want to just open it again. Are there ways in which reading this book makes you think like, oh, okay, there's this new thing I can do? Or are there ways in which reading the book has made you say like, hmm, I see this thing, but I actually find like maybe there's an opportunity for me to open that thing up wider than I thought before. Or is this book asking questions about your own spiritual development um, that have been healthy for you to chase?
Well, as I said earlier, I think there are a lot of things that St. Thomas does really well, but what I liked about the book was giving you ideas from what other churches have done and found successful and giving us then ideas on how to tweak what we're doing so that that we do it better. And I do think that you're very affirming and open when people want to try something new. Well, if you want to do that, go ahead. You know, that's a good idea. <laughs> The kind of thing. Uh, so I think there's a fair amount of that going on. And, and I also love all the different books that we've been reading. I've been struggling the last few months to keep up with everything. I have read them. I'm trying to go back and see the Zoom classes I've missed. Um, but it's such a variety that it really, there are a lot of things that, that are very thought provoking. And some of them are just very different. So I, I have enjoyed that a lot. Thanks, Kathy. I'm hoping that there uh, are more people in our parish who are reading this book than are showing up on the screen. I know uh, in service recently, you mentioned, you mentioned the, that we're doing this study and you encouraged other people to read it even if they couldn't join, join us. So I'm hoping that that, that is the case. I, I share your hope and you know, it, it occurs to me that like maybe this is another way that we can invite people is just by talking up resources we've enjoyed. And, um, you know, I, I hope I do it because, it, but I'm not the only one. And, I, you know, again, I think this is something that we just sort of do naturally when we have a good shopping experience. We're like, have you been to that place? I really enjoyed the atmosphere. The food was really good. I just read the craziest book <laughs> about, you know, this lady who says there's no value in uh, the crucifixion, that that represents an affront to everything good in the world. And, you know, I was a really interesting idea for me. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I do think that's an invitation, you know, like, I think that's a way we can do this with authenticity. And people might say like, oh, God, well, I'll pray for you. Hey, I'd be grateful for that. You know, it probably won't hurt. <laughs> And I recommend this book. I think you might really like to think about it. Yeah. And Mike says, we do have the blessing box out in front of the church. That's another way if people have read it and it's not a book they think they would actually keep and refer to, to put it out there, or even particularly with the invite, welcome, connect, maybe the church just buys three or four copies and puts them out there. And we make a point of saying, you know, if you need a copy, here's one. And when you read it, return it so other people can share it. That might inspire more people to do it if they don't, oh, I keep forgetting to order it and get a copy, but I was interested in where you can just stop by and pick one up. Thank you. That's a great idea. Well, I I, uh, I appreciate your your thoughtfulness and your attention and your thinking through this deeply. And I just want to tell you one one last story that you probably hear again at ten thirty. I didn't share it at eight, but I actually was talking to my non church going uh, life partner yesterday, and I said, you know, I just have these strange moments where I just wonder about my own piety. Because both of us grew up where like there was a kind of piety you were supposed to have. And uh, I still like since I don't have that kind of piety, <laughs> I find myself nervous a little bit like, well, I don't even know what kind of priest, you know, I am because I, I didn't look anything like the way we were both formed to, to, to look or think. And uh, my, uh, my non-church going life partner said, well, you know, I see this commitment to like social justice in you that like I, I think is about the most pious thing there is. So um, you just do that. <laughs> and you know what I realized was like, I think that's really what she's asking us. She's asking us to do here. Instead of like 
having a mold that people have to fit is to try really hard to find how how they're embodying things like grace. And uh, part of that ministerial vision is to trust that God is fully present in other people, even if it's not, not in traditional ways, so that we can look for it and search for it and then celebrate it and even tell them, like, there's that really cool thing that you do, you know? Um, I, 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 that seems to be good. And the more we can do that, um, the better empowering people like you do that one. I just noticed you did that thing and you probably didn't even think twice about it, but I've thought like four times about it and it was really cool. And, and I wonder if that isn't part of, you know, again, just taking the risk of affirmation. I think mainly because we, we um, it's so easy to be critical and our brains have actually evolved to be more critical than they are affirmative. Uh, she didn't say this in the book, but I, but I do wonder if it's a spiritual discipline, looking to affirm something you see a visitor do would be a really wonderful invitation. I'm going to try it. <laughs> Thank you all for joining. Really looking forward to reading the next few chapters with you. And um, if you're on the Four Vision Quests of Jesus, I'll see you Wednesday. And if you're not, I hope you're reading that book anyway, because it's a really great Really great book. Um, see you soon. Grateful for you all.